Once Kennedy was nominated, however, he quickly fell into law. He hated Richard Nixon. Uh, he believed that Nixon had called him a traitor in the 1952 campaign. Um, as he told, <laughs> he told more than one audience that fall, if you vote for Nixon, you ought to go to hell. <laughs> Direct and to the point. The Kennedy-Nixon race was but the latest instance where Truman and Hoover agreed to disagree. Its outcome, however, produced a, a, an astonishing role reversal. This story is still not well known. Um, there were Republicans, including Dwight Eisenhower, who did not want to concede the election, who believed that enough votes had been stolen in Illinois and Texas, uh, there were enough voting irregularities there and elsewhere to make Richard Nixon president. Um, there were demands for a national recount, and Republican national chairman uh, set all this in motion. Uh, and anyone who remembers 2000 uh, can imagine, you know, the prolonged period of uncertainty that would have ensued. This at the height of the Cold War. Uh, behind the scenes, an unlikely pair of power brokers were at work. Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, the pop Truman found so objectionable, was a very good friend of Herbert Hoover's. He, in fact, had been a mainstay of the original Hoover Commission. Bobby Kennedy's first job was with the Hoover Commission. Um, in the years since, the ambassador had remained friendly with the former president, to whom he now appealed for help in certifying his son's election. With a well-timed phone call, Hoover was able to engineer a public handshake between JFK and a somewhat reluctant Richard Nixon. President Kennedy reciprocated by visiting Hoover in his Waldorf Tower suite and by making the old man honorary chairman of the Peace Corps. If not yet in vogue, Herbert Hoover was at last out of Coventry. At the age of 88, he thanked Truman for adding 10 years to his lifespan. Yours has been a friendship, he wrote, which has reached deeper into my life than you know. Truman responded that Hoover must reach 100, as he fully intended to do. On the eve of his 90th birthday, in August of 1964, a frail, toothless man sat in his wheelchair, clutching a blue robe and savoring the World Series on one of the new color television sets uh, to which American consumers were being introduced that fall. Reluctant to have his picture taken, Herbert Hoover relented only when it was pointed out that the sole other president to reach such a milestone, John Adams, would doubtlessly have wept at such an innovative disruption to his palsied old age. Suddenly, Hoover turned to the wife of a young friend. What did she most want out of life? He asked her. She thought, and then replied truthfully, that she was content with her lot, satisfied with her home, happy with her husband and children. For her, the status quo was a worthy aspiration. Herbert Hoover drew back in horror. How can you say a thing like that, he demanded. I want more. I want to write a better book. I want to have more friends. I just want more. Two months later, he was stricken with internal bleeding. Fighting words for his recovery came from a hospital room in Kansas City. If he hadn't broken his ribs in a recent bathtub fall, said Truman, he would be on his way to the Waldorf to offer encouragement in person. Bathtubs are a menace to ex-presidents, Hoover wired back. <laughs> for as you may recall, a bathtub rose up and fractured my vertebrae when I was in Venezuela on your world famine mission in 1946. It was the last message sent from Suite 31A of the Waldorf Towers. Hoover died on the morning of October 20th, 1964. He was my good friend, said Truman, on learning of Hoover's death, and I was his. Truer words were never spoken. There is a curious sequel of sorts, as long as reconciliation is our theme. Um, Mr. Truman stopped going to his office regularly about 1966. His health began to decline. Um, however, a year before that, a remarkable tribute was paid to him. I remember it was Harry Truman who in 1948 talked about universal health insurance for Americans, particularly for the elderly. 
It took a while, as it sometimes does, but under Lyndon Johnson, that came to pass in the Medicare program. So in 1965, LBJ flew to Independence, and at the Truman Library, in front of Harry and Bess Truman, signed the Medicare bill, and then he presented them with Medicare cards number one and number two. Now, uh, three, four years after that, a somewhat less welcome visitor appeared, uh, Richard Nixon, in the first year of his presidency, wanting bygones to be bygones, showed up in Independence, and he brought with him the piano that had been in the Truman White House that he was donating to the, to the, to the Truman Museum. And he sat down, as you know, Mr. Nixon played the piano. He sat down thinking that he would delight Harry Truman by playing his theme song. And he played the Missouri Waltz. And it turned out that Harry Truman hated the Missouri Waltz. <laughs> <laughs> Could not abide it. And was so sick of hearing it for 30 years, the only saving grace was, by that time, he was too deaf to even hear what Mr. Nixon was playing. <laughs> Anyway, questions, comments, observations? Um, anyone? Yeah? You love them all, but who's your favorite president? That's not a fair question. I, I don't have a fair, well, obviously, Gerald Ford is my favorite president um, for reasons that, you know, probably disqualify me from answering that question. Um, I think that, I don't mean to be facetious, I mean, I would, you know, reword the question to, you know, who's the most important president? And there's no doubt that Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan are the two presidents who I think had the greatest historical impact. Theodore Roosevelt at the beginning of the century arguably belongs in that troika. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is, is, uh, is, is very close. So, uh, but every, every one of them, you know, every one of them is more interesting than the textbooks suggest. Um, it's interesting, you know, in the C-SPAN series, I, I, a couple weeks ago, a gentleman called in. I'll call him a gentleman. Um, uh, he was uh, hot under the collar, and he was very upset because he thought we were trying to uh, deify all of these presidents. And I thought, um, I bit my tongue in. Um, but I thought to myself, you know, the interesting thing is, that's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is to show you these people as human beings. Um, and in, un, in unguarded moments, because so much of the modern presidency has been subsumed in this, you know, political theater, um, that it's, uh, it's, it's rare when, when you feel like you're breaking through all of that. And, um, in any event, Theodore Roosevelt certainly created the modern presidency. Uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, took America into the world in a way that um, still reverberates. There is still the notion of Wilsonian foreign policy, um, which is also subject to various interpretations. But uh, Franklin Roosevelt arguably saved democratic capitalism. He certainly saved capitalism from capitalists, um, and uh, I think, and Ronald Reagan, uh, whatever you, you know, the people debate the Cold War for years, but there's no doubt that Ronald Reagan transformed the political culture of this country and left behind a consensus that was quite different from what he found on taking office. So, uh, anyway, yeah. Do you feel, in light of that, that the 